I've got two fault finds and an EICR. I love it. I find it high pressure. That's interesting, isn't it? Huh? That's pretty sweet. Okay, so I've found the issue. Yeah, well, it's definitely not how I left it. Come on, everybody. We can get straight into it today because we have a very big day ahead of us. I've got two fault finds and an EICR and you're gonna come with me on all of them. The trouble is, with the fault find, as with all fault finds, especially on heating systems, it could take five minutes or it could take 10 hours. So what I think we'll do is get dive straight into it and uh, keep you in on the process and talk you through what I found as well. This is tool of the day today, it's pretty sick. I'm fault finding on heating systems. So the issue is the hot water isn't turning off. It's permanently hot and I can I can feel the pipe, both sides is red hot and the two port valve here is open. So the first thing I want to do is identify what type of heating system it is so I can see that it's an S-plan system. So that means I have two, so, um, two separate circuits for heating and for um, hot water. So I've got this two port valve down here, that's for heating. I can feel that that's off right now, so that's fine because some radiators are off at the minute because they're doing work. This is all being renovated, this house at the minute. Um, so that's off, that's fine. And then this two port valve here, you can see that's loose. So that means that that is open at the minute. You want to feel some resistance as I push that open if it was closed. So that is open, I can feel the water running through there. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to check to see if this is wired up correctly because it's only been added recently. So it's very possible that um, it's just wired in wrong. What I'll do is I'll pull up a wiring diagram just to make it a bit clearer to explain what it is that I'm looking for. Um, thanks to Flameport, I'm pretty sure that's John Ward, um, to make this a bit clearer. Forget the programmer for now, we don't need that. And the room thermostat, again, we're not using that. We're using the Tado. The Tado replaces both of these bits. It's just a switch. That's all that it literally is, is a switch. So the hot water valve, we've obviously got our commons. Um, and permanents and switches. So we want to make sure that it's going through the cylinder thermostat first of all. So if we trace this up to here, these sensors are always so busy. Ay, jeez, that's hot. <laughs> can't help but get absolutely, I'm just gonna turn it off. Can't help but get absolutely melted when you're working on these things. What I want to see as well is if this valve returns off, now I've turned the power off, it could just be an issue with this valve. Do you know what? I think it might just be an issue with that valve. Because when you turn the power off, it should just straight away zip back off again. But that's still on, even with no power. So that's interesting, isn't it? Might have just saved herself a whole lot of fault finding time there. What I'll do, I'll nip the front cover off of this two port valve here. There we go. What have we got in here? Just looks to me like a faulty two port valve. What I can do is, I can try and pop it out. Oh, that looks like someone's already had it partially off. See that screw there? That screw there is already out. I didn't take that out. I think therein might lie the answer. There we go, now it's releasing. Ah, interesting. So now it's releasing, do you see that? That's how it should be when you turn the power off. So what we can do, rather than check through all the wiring a load of times and wasting our time, we're going to turn it back on and see if that opens. I think it's this button here. I've called for hot water. The only thing is, it might well be that this cylinder thermostat is already so hot it doesn't want it. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to temporarily just turn that thermostat up. So I can feel that one working and see that. All right, look at, the, uh, look at the spring on here. Right. Oh, jeez. <laughs> so I've just called for heating. So I want to feel this start to get loose now as it opens up. All right, so if you focus in on this little lever here, you'll see when I satisfy the heating, I just want to see that pop back. So I satisfy it. There you go. You see that little lever springing back there? So the heating's all right. But obviously, there's no pressure at the minute in there. So it's just this one here at the minute is still... Still open, let's see if this valve feels sticky. Yeah, that feels super stiff. I can't turn that, I should be able to turn that fairly, fairly easily, but it's, 
super stiff. What I reckon is it's probably a problem with that. It's so freaking messy. I can't work out what's what. Let's take this off. Get my sick glasses off. Have a swig of drink. Nothing nicer on a hot summer's day than getting into a red hot heating cupboard surrounded by 5,000 degree pipes. We're going to share the tool of the day today. It's not just going to be the Klein Tools one. It's going to be this little weirder bit check thing. I tell you, it's so sick. So well made, it's ridiculous. See, all this, half the screws have already been taken out of this. Someone's already had this apart before. I'm not really worried about the actual mechanisms of it. So you see this little micro switch here. We want to test this micro switch and we want to test this motor here to make sure it spins. So I'll just nip the micro switch out. The thing is as well when I'm fault finding, so I'm always so aware that I want to find it in the first hour. We charge a call out and the first hour is included. So it's like, I do not want to waste the customer's time or money. I love it. I find it high pressure. I absolutely love it. It's like I'm racing against the clock. And I usually, 90% of the time, I can find it in the first hour. Unless it's literally a ridiculous fault, you can usually find it in the first hour. You might not be able to fix it in the first hour, but you can identify it, which is what you're hired in to do. We can test this switch. Turn the power back on. Now we have to be careful not to get belts off of all of this stuff. Let's see if anything's live just now. 240 volts there. Nothing on that side. Okay. Switch is working fine. So I'm not worried about this little micro switch, but this motor doesn't seem to be doing anything at all, does it? Always touch it at the back of your hand. <laughs> when doing sketchy work, act sketchy. When doing sketchy work, always act sketchy. I just flick it with the back of my finger before I touch it. Just make sure. Try and. Whoa. So you want to be seeing that spinning like that. See? That's what you want to be hearing. Feels pretty free, it's just not moving, is it? And all this spring mechanism is doing is literally just resetting it. And then that comes and touches that little limit switch there. I've tested that switch. That switch is all good. This, however, this little motor, doesn't seem to be doing anything at all. So, I think we've found our issue. And I reckon it's just this valve here. It's freed up a little bit now, but it was really stiff earlier, so it could be that that's been stiff and burnt it out. So what I'm going to recommend is a new one of these. I'm going to recommend a new two port valve. I think I'll try just the actuator, um, because that does feel like it's moving now. We'll replace the actuator on the two port valve, and then I think that will be the fault found. So this is the grey, so this is my permanent live. So I want to see when I've got reference to earth, 240 volts. And then on this one here, okay, I'm getting some voltage, but this isn't a low Z tester, or if it is, I'm not using it correctly. So um, I'm getting basically no real voltage. And then when I push this switch here, this, is the gr this orange one is the switch live back to the boiler. So I want to see once this limit switch is pushed, 240 volts come on. There we go, 240 volts. So this switch is definitely working okay. So I know the voltage is right. I know the wiring is very likely right. That's the switch line then going back to the boiler, telling either pump to come on or whatever sequence of events, depending on what, um, what sort of system you're running. But yeah, that's all good. It just seems to be this motor. So I just wanted to double check that. Now I'm pretty confident that's what it is. I would just recommend that this actuator is replaced. And uh, that should fix it, I think, because you can see this has freed itself up now. If they find there's still an issue, then I would then get this valve replaced, but it's always best to do the cheapest part first and try that. Right, so what I'm going to recommend is get a plumber to come in, swap that for a new valve, 
just in case that's the thing that's burnt out the uh, thing because it feels so stiff. Swap the um, actuator as well, which will come on the valve anyways. Um, and then that is job one solved. On to the next one. One minute. It's kind of come partially back. <laughs> I might have actually fixed it. I think I might have freed up the valve. When I turn it on now, I can push it all the way over, nice and smooth. Now watch, remember what I said earlier, it should flick back. If I turn the call for heating off, there it goes back. So I seem to have freed it up from playing around with the valve, but it still doesn't seem right. So what I'm, I'm still going to suggest that the valve is replaced because it feels super, super stiff. At least they have some measure of hot water for now. <laughs> Next job is 28 minutes away. Huh? Man, 28 minutes to do about 12 miles, only in Cambridge. So that's good. That seems to be fixed now, actually. All I've done is just taken it apart, moved it about a bit to free it up and put it back together again. But I think that valve is just a bit sticky, but that's a plumbing issue. I should have clarified this, but I didn't. Um, that's my pocket for that. The reason why he called us out was because it, it wasn't that he noticed the water was always hot because obviously you always want your hot water to be hot. But it's because the boiler wouldn't turn off. The boiler was constantly kicking in and that's because it was always calling for, calling for the boiler to be on through the uh, two-port valve and that's because that switch was locked in that open position. But now it seems to be flicking back. So what I've said is use it for a little while. If it's okay, carry on, but it will fail eventually. And when it does fail, just get the two-port valve replaced by a plumber. Um, and then it'll be nice and loose and that will be all sorted. So now we have an EICR, so I'll see you there. Got this sent to me, very kind, from Surf Base Bark. Pretty sweet that. Clip that on the side of my bag. Naughty, naughty. I didn't want him to think I was ungrateful for not thanking him yet. I just genuinely hadn't got around to um, actually using it and putting it on yet, but now I have. Thank you very much. Right, so we've arrived at our EICR. Got my little table set up and this is what we're dealing with. So. First thing, look at the main head, all the metering, is it all okay, all in place, there's no gaps or holes, can't see any copper. See what type of earthing setup it is, it's a TNCS or a PME system, see the earth and neutral are combined. Got an isolator, again, make sure there's no copper, any gaps, no signs of burning, evidence of heat, all looking good. Let's do the big reveal. Oh dear me, <laughs> don't know my trap. So we've got two newer circuits here and some older ones and another newer one. So that's not too bad. It all looks okay. No bad smells or anything. You want to make sure you don't have that horrible fishy smell. It's important in lots of aspects of life. Um, no electrical burning smell. Um, things I'm taking note of. Okay, so the RCD here, this 30 milliamp RCD. It is a type, oh, look at that. Tell me what type RCD that is. Go on, Max. Get your zoomy zoom on that bad boy. Actually pleasantly surprised at that. Wasn't expecting it. Um, cool. All right, let's get started. Let's do our paperwork and also do a little walk round. Because remember, it's a test and inspection. Inspection and testing, not testing and inspection. And there's a reason why it's that way round. That is because the inspection is really should be carried out first. You want to look around the property, get a feel for it see um, see what there is, see what you're working with, and then you know what it is that you're testing. Um, do you like these? They're just my normal sunglasses, but I put these bad boys on it. I thought, I can't tell if I look like Betty White revived, or if they look cool. Let me know in the comments. Actually, I don't trust your comments anyway. You guys said my Heelys weren't cool, so. Right, so first things first, I'm going to get my ZE. So I'm going to flip my tester over to high current. It's line and earth I'm going to be testing between. Usually for ZE, you disconnect the main earth. However, he's working from home. I've got his Wi Fi on a Jackery, but still, I don't want to be cutting the power while he's here. Um, I'm not going to cut all of the circuits. So it's not safe to leave the property energized with the main earth connected. I will have the parallel paths connected um, when I do it, but I've put on the limitations on the certificate that for my ZE, 
I have got main earth still in the bar. 0 0.23. So now I'm going to get my so that's my PEFC. I'm going to get my PFCC. So I need to get my neutral now. And that's perfect anyway, because you need to do that with it all energized. And uh, I'll get those readings. So what I what I like to do, I go through the certificate page by page. I start on the boards page, fill out all the information for the board, do like the brand, the breaker sizes, set the board out. And then once it's all set out with the main tests like earthing and PFCC and PEFC and stuff, I go around, I do my inspection, I can assign any faults I find then to those circuits, and then I do my test after that. So I'll do that now. I'm just taking stuff off at random. Well, nobody's home as well. I don't really like these things. These, I think, are more dangerous than anything else because the actual English design socket, you can't get into the live terminal because only when the earth pops in, this longer one, it pushes a flat down to get to it. Whereas I think if that snapped off, then you're actually making the, the British standard design more unsafe. So personally, I prefer to leave them off when I have any ICR and I see them. It's fine. Must be another socket that doesn't work. Or maybe, I think it was just that switch was off. That's all it was. Okay, well, one problem solved. However, that's not the end of line. So it's very likely that you have a junction box with them all. Let's just pop another one down. Hot. Yeah, there's junction boxes. Oh, no. Let's take it at a couple points because the trouble is they're all end of line, so there's a junction box somewhere, but I can't access it. I can see the ends of a junction box here, but that's just one of them, and that looks reasonably all right. But if I just choose a few lights at random and make sure I've got an earth there, then and it's a reasonable reading, which it is, then that's the best I can really do for an EICR. One thing I will recommend is that these are replaced for fire rated downlighters just because of the location and there's no fire hood or heat hood above here and it's a baking hot halogen lamp. Um, yeah, what would you guys code that? Hmm? No fire rated downlights in a kitchen with a bedroom above it. Let me know in the comments. Definitely do a replacement though, I can tell you that much. I think it's definitely past its 10 year battery date. All right, let's link that out. Test both of those smokes. Happy days. Little testing lead is absolutely awesome because now I can just pop that in, run, test every point that I want to test and then pop it, put it back on, move it along to the next one, pop it in. But just a word of advice from one friend to another. Do not put it on the live side of the breaker when the breaker is switched on. Another little thing, if you want to save your wrists, I've seen Nick Bundy using this and I thought, ah, it's just a gimmick. Now I've got it for EICRs. It saves me so much time. If you want any advice as well for EICRs, by the way, because today's video I'm rushing through it a little bit because I've literally, I've got another fault find in a couple of hours and I've not even had lunch yet. My cup of tea went cold. I'm very busy today. If you would like any information whatsoever on EICRs, I'm really trying hard to be more active on my Instagram and my social medias because I know sometimes I'm really bad replying on there. I'm never ignoring anybody and I'm sorry if it ever comes across that way. It's just sometimes messages get lost. But if I can help you in any way at all, this is my Instagram. Give me a follow, give me a message and I'll try my best to answer questions best I can. Okay, so I'm just about to put this switch back here. You can see it's pretty full. And when I push it back, all the wires pop out of place. So there's actually a product which I've been sent, which I was waiting to use. I feel like this might be a good time. It's made by, if you can read that better than me, Tamoy, Tamo Electric, Tamoy Electric. And uh, what it does is it protects the screws when you're pushing them through. So they have three different sizes. Let's pop it in and demonstrate. So pop that one there. 
Wow, I need to turn that smoke alarm back on. That is so annoying. Okay. Push this one out of the way there. And then you see, now when the screws go through, they're not gonna nick the cables because it does happen sometimes where you nick a cable. Whereas now they're protected for when that goes through there. So it's actually pretty cool. I like that. There you go, I've just grabbed this out of the van so I can actually demonstrate it. It's kind of hard to show you when it's full of cables, but you can see there, that's all covered now. So there's no chance of any cables when you're pushing the switch back in to get them pushed against it. So it just saves a bit of time really when you're wrestling it in. It just makes it a slightly better quality install if you've got a really busy switch. I think we've got a link in the description below, but I appreciate the fella for sending them out to us. It's like, it's probably not something that I'll use on every install, but it's something that's definitely worth having in your bag just when you've got those full switches. You don't fancy blowing yourself up. Just got two more circuits left, both the socket circuits. They're both, both rings, it shouldn't take too long. What I do is I just run around with this, see which ones are on that circuit. Then I know which ones I need to test. And then I'm off to my final fault find of the day. So that's pretty sweet. So now, time to do the ring final testing. So what we do, pop this on there, on this little nifty little sausage on the end of that. Solid side to solid side. Bosh. Zero that out. There we go. Get our end to end readings on each side of the ring. 0 0.56, 0 0.56. I'm expecting this to be 1.67 times higher because that is how much smaller it is than 2.5 mil. 0.92, that is fine. Right, on to the next one. So, we made it. We're here, that was a very quick journey, wasn't it? Being called here because the outside lights that have been installed are dripping, not being installed by me. Could be a fault that's there already, could be something else that's been added, but what I'm gonna do, I'm gonna start in the middle, take the fitting off, test each way, see what happens. Okay, so I've nipped that off. I'm gonna go see if I can reset the breaker and see which one is tripping. So you may remember me installing this a little while ago. And then I went away for a bit, <laughs> a bit like the original electrician that was working on. So I didn't actually finish it and uh, the outside light wasn't rendered. All the outside walls weren't rendered yet, so I didn't get to do the outside lights. So I'm not sure who has actually finished this. Yeah, well, it's definitely not how I left it. Outside lights, right, so that is being popped out. So is that one. I wonder if it trips immediately or if it's more of a slow process. What I'm going to do is I'm going to pop the neutral in. Okay, that's good. At least that doesn't trip. So if there is a fault, it's either a line to neutral or a line to earth. Where were they going to though? I don't remember. Outside, but inside doors. Yeah. It was these ones. All right, don't be alarmed if it goes bang. Line of neutral in, channel one, channel two. Okay, well that's fine, that's working. So I'll just pop that in. It's a bit heartbreaking when you spend ages, spend ages making something look nice. But if someone's been here fault finding, which obviously have been, and I've been called here to finish off fault finding, then, um, and by the way, I don't think I don't think it was Lee and Luke. I think it was just another spark. Then sometimes when you fault find, and I get it, it's stressful. You take things apart, but it's always a little bit heartbreaking. That's all I'm saying. I reckon they've popped the way you go out or something in there. I've got this one on, but I don't really understand what the issue is. It all seems to be coming on fine. I've not really been filled in. I've just got told the lighting was tripping outside which obviously like I said I've not worked on can you go and figure out what's wrong but as far as I can tell the breakers on it's all coming on unless it's been fixed and I've been sent it back and the customer isn't home either <laughs> and the other customer is in a meeting so I can't actually speak to him so I'm a bit perplexed to what the actual issue is it's 
to be honest. I see where it's gone bang, just there, look. See that screw, I reckon what's happened is where it's a bit of a tight fitting, because lighting manufacturers just don't listen. I can't, I really can't blame whoever did install this light, to be perfectly honest. There's really not much space in the back of here. So probably they've just pushed it back in and then over time it's just rubbed and gone bang. Yes, yeah, the actual fitting's working now. Okay, so I've found the issue. Do you see that little bit there? And the little nick there? See where it's gone black? It's just a bit too tight in there. They actually, I've pulled it out now, but I can't really fault the way it's been connected. It has been connected very neatly and it's always nice to leave lots of slack but the manufacturer has just not left enough room in these light fittings for it to be wired with slack on the cable, at least not swooped down like that. It's literally millimeters to spare. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to replace it for Wagos and bring all the cables straight up and have to cut them a bit shorter. I mean, if I can push a bit back into the wall, there we go. There's a bit back in the wall anyway, like I can pull more forward. So if they do ever change light fittings, they should still have options. And I'm just gonna bend, I'm gonna cut it about there. Just replacing them with where he goes. And I'll push it up there like that. And you see, then it will just sit flat and it's out the way because that little driver needs to sit in there. So those cables being swooped around there, whilst that is a really nice job and a, you know, a lovely way of doing it, I'm not faulting it. It just, um, it's not gonna work with these light fittings. So unfortunately that has got to change. Fault found, fault fixed, that is everything now. So, done both our fault finds, done our ERCRs. I'm absolutely wrecked, I'm so hot, I need to go have a cold shower and chill out. Thank you very much for watching. Don't forget to like and subscribe. Any questions, comments below, hit me up on Instagram. I'll see you next time.